the westward march of the Columbia River to the Pacific Ocean scores the boundary between the states of Oregon and Washington. It cuts through the heart of the Cascade Range, creating a natural passage through the mountains known as the Columbia River Gorge. This river is busy with maritime traffic for both business and pleasure. Both banks of the Columbia are lined with steel rails, and the competition between the railroads is great. In part one of our two-part series, we covered Union Pacific's Portland subdivision in Oregon, heading east to Hinkle Yard. Now, let's return west along the BNSF and see the gorge from the Washington side. We will begin at BNSF's Hump Yard in Pasco and head west to Vancouver. You'll see heavy Powder River Basin coal trains. Hot Z trains. Garbage trains. Mixed manifests. And a special visit from SP Daylight Steam Locomotive number 4449. All in the amazing setting of the Columbia River Gorge. Join us now for Columbia River Gorge Part 2, BNSF Railway's Fallbridge Subdivision. The Fallbridge subdivision begins in Portland, Oregon, at Union Station, milepost 0.0. .0. It crosses both the Willamette and Columbia Rivers, arriving in Vancouver, Washington, where it turns east along the Columbia's north bank, following the watercourse for nearly 230 miles. We will be traveling east to west from SPNS Junction near Pasco. The Fallbridge subdivision actually departs the junction in a southeasterly direction as the Columbia makes a large half circle, eventually turning west near the McNary Dam. We will continue through Roosevelt, Wishram, Lyle, Bingen, and North Bonneville before arriving at Vancouver Station. There's lots to see, so let's get started now. Our westward journey through the Columbia River Gorge begins at BNSF's Hump Yard, just northwest of downtown Pasco. Three GE-944CWs make their way through the yard after being fueled and serviced, and will soon be taking a train northeast to Spokane. Pasco Yard was originally built by the Northern Pacific in 1884 at the confluence of the Columbia and Snake Rivers. It served as a junction between rail lines from Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, and Spokane, and today continues to serve as an important hub on the Northern Transcon. This is also the northern terminus for traffic out of California via the inside gateway. A Burlington Northern Herald still adorns a brick yard tower and crew office located near the hump, which is busy day and night. The hump yard was added by the Northern Pacific in 1955, a first for the railroad. Cars to be sorted are pushed up an incline and uncoupled as they reach the top. Gravity then takes over and the cars roll freely through computer-controlled switches to one of 47 classification tracks located below. On the downhill descent, retarders adjust each car's speed by gripping their wheels. Speed is calculated by the weight of the car and the distance it has to travel through the yard. Temperature also plays a role as cars roll much farther if the rail is warm. Here we can see several cars rolling through the classification yard, all on separate tracks, as trains are made up for destinations all across America.
Not all the cars you'll see at Pasco are off to interesting destinations. Near the car shop, an unfortunate boxcar awaits its fate after apparently suffering a fire. Refurbished SD40-2s continue to keep busy in the yard, as does an occasional GP30 still wearing BN's Cascade Green. The fueling track is populated by modern-day Jeevos and Dash 9s, the most common power on today's BNSF. Upon leaving Pasco, trains must cross to the north side of the Columbia River, which at this point is a half mile wide and 45 feet deep. To do this, Northern Pacific constructed an impressive 10-span through truss drawbridge, reaching 2,587 feet across the river. Our first train of the day, BNSF 9175 West, takes a heavy coal drag across the bridge. As the head end comes off the bridge, it enters the Fallbridge subdivision at SPNS Junction, milepost 229.7. This train originated in Wyoming's Powder River Basin and is bound for the export terminal at Roberts Bank, British Columbia, Canada. The train is now rolling on the former Spokane, Portland, and Seattle line, which was chartered in 1905 by James J. Hill to connect the Northern Pacific and Great Northern with Portland, Oregon, a connection that continues to be heavily used today. Moving a couple miles to the west, we set up at Hover, a 7,932-foot siding near milepost 228. BNSF 7597 East takes a Z train to Pasco for a crew change. As the train continues past the camera, it ducks under the Union Pacific's Kalen Industrial Spur Track, which crosses the Columbia River south of the BNSF. The 7597 East slows as it approaches the Columbia River drawbridge. Train movement is controlled by an automatic block system between East Hover and Pasco, with authority granted by the Pasco Tower operator, while CTC is in effect from here west to Vancouver. Between Yalepet and Finley, an auto rack train led by BNSF 5148 crosses a small causeway as it races east on the 50 mile per hour track.
Continuing west, the railroad passes the McNary Dam, just east of the siding at Plymouth. The dam stretches nearly one and a half miles across the Columbia, generating 980 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power nearly one million homes. The whine of GEAC traction motors announce a westbound 96 car grade train as BNSF 5605 passes the dam. The train slows as it nears the 9,351-foot siding at Plymouth. It will go in the hole to let a higher-priority Z train get by. Moving on ahead, we catch the Z train passing milepost 188 just west of Plymouth, with BNSF 4484 in the lead. This section of the Columbia River is known as Lake Umatilla. It stretches 110 miles between the John Day Dam and McNary Dam. Our grain train is seen again as it approaches a talking detector at milepost 177.2. Detector, milepost 177.2. No defects. Repeat, no defects. Total axle 402 out. An eastbound 88 car manifest crosses Glade Creek near milepost 174.
the climate is semi-arid on the east end of the Columbia River Gorge. A warm breeze rustles through the grass above Whitcomb Island. Looking across the river, we see the Port of Moro, located in the state of Oregon. Another eastbound rolls past mile marker 173 in the late afternoon. Early in the morning, Amtrak 27 blasts around a high-speed curve between Whitcomb and McCready. East of the siding at McCready, milepost 160, a Roberts Bank coal train heads west just after sunrise. Besides trains, competing river barge traffic can be seen working up and down the Columbia River. The family-owned Shaver Barge Company has been in business since 1880. Based in Portland, Oregon, they have a fleet of 16 barges and 10 tugs. This grain barge is heading west near Roosevelt, Washington, passing a man-made forest of wind turbines. The Columbia River Gorge is still 40 miles to the west but one can find beauty in the wide open country spanning either side of this mighty river. The pungent smell of sage fills the air. Grain elevators come into view as we approach Roosevelt. Horsehaven grain handles wheat, barley, and corn and has a capacity of 998,000 bushels at this facility. Besides grain, special double stack containers made for hauling garbage populate the tracks around the elevators. Trash from Seattle and other locations is shipped by rail, then taken by truck to the nearby Roosevelt landfill. Empties then return west by train. BNSF 5383 West enters the 8,459-foot siding at Roosevelt to meet Amtrak 28, the eastbound Portland section of the Empire Builder. We watch as the manifest comes to an easy stop.
It isn't long before Amtrak comes into view at 70 miles per hour. Soon, the 5383 is again on the move, while a garbage train waits to do some work before returning west. Twilight falls on Roosevelt as the BNSF 4305 departs with 5,979 feet of empty containers. As we continue west, the Columbia begins to cut deeper into the earth. From ground level, it's hard to see the high green signal at 1391 for Amtrak 27. This section of the Empire Builder runs between Spokane, Washington and Portland, Oregon, while the rest of the train continues on to Seattle following the Great Northern's route over Stevens Pass. Both Amtrak routes are intensely scenic and worth the price of a train ticket.
A morning garbage train is in the hole at East Bates. The high green is for a ballast train. We set up above milepost 137 to catch the meat. A westbound UP manifest gleams in the morning light on the Oregon side of the river, while BNSF 1008 leads the garbage train out of the siding on its way to Roosevelt. On a different day, we find a grain train in the hole at West Bates for BNSF 4506 East. Soon, the BNSF 5625 has a clear signal for westbound movement and leads the 110-car loaded grain train onto the main track.
Relocating to Goodno, four miles to the west, we are in time to see Amtrak 28, the eastbound Empire Builder, as it passes giant rock formations above the river. The train passes milepost 131 and disappears around a curve below the giant basalt face that is part of the state of Oregon. It isn't long before another train approaches. BNSF 4695 West leads a 101 car manifest past milepost 130 between Bates and Toll. The train continues west as evening draws near. The Columbia takes on the silvery hue of the late day sun, shining pale through the advancing clouds. The next morning at 5.30 a.m., BNSF 4949 rolls through Goodnow, while behind it, the sheer cliffs of Oregon begin to show signs of the coming day. A westbound Tidewater barge appears hauling overseas containers. In just a few miles, it will reach the lock at the John Day Dam. There is something relaxing about watching a river barge pass by, so let's pause for a moment as it drifts downstream.
Oregon side of the river is bathed in morning sunlight as a Union Pacific stack train led by UP 4294 rolls west between the sidings of Quentin and Goff. The sound of the train carries easily across the water. The Columbia extends before us at Toll. Just beyond a green navigation marker, we can make out a westbound coal train, which will be here in just a few minutes. BNSF 6342 West leads 122 loads of Powder River Basin coal past the 9,136-foot siding. As we continue downstream, we come to the John Day Dam, which was completed in 1971, forming Lake Umatilla. From high up on a rocky cliff, we get a great view of a westbound loaded grain train as it passes the north end of the dam.
we take a closer look at the John Day Dam from the north side. 20 spillway gates regulate the flow of water from Lake Umatilla. They are often all needed to handle the higher volume of water during the spring runoff. This creates quite a bit of turbulence just below the dam, making for a rough ride for small watercraft who get too close. The Columbia River Dam system has a series of locks to allow cargo ships to navigate the river. At 110 feet, the John Day Dam has the highest lift of any lock in the U.S. A westbound tug is ready to exit the lock at John Day. We speed up the camera to show the giant lower gate as it opens. When a downstream vessel enters a lock, the upper gate is closed and the water slowly drained, bringing it to the level of the lower side of the dam. Soon the tug emerges, towing a special barge containing ocean-bound juvenile salmon. The barge is basically a floating fish hatchery pond. The Army Corps of Engineers developed this system to ensure healthy populations of salmon in the Columbia River. The tug Umatilla lends its 1,350 horsepower to the effort as the tow continues downstream. It's one of 10 tugs on the roster for the Shaver Company. We return our attention to the rails as an eastbound Z train passes cliffs just above the dam. The train maintains a good clip of around 60 miles per hour on the slight 0.2% uphill grade. After the train passes, a Tidewater tug approaches from downstream. This will enable us to show the process from the other direction. As the tug approaches the lock, a spotter helps guide the pilot into the chamber. This lock measures 86 feet wide and is 675 feet long. Careful navigation is required to get the barge safely inside the lock. After the lower gate is closed, the lock is flooded with water from upstream, lifting the barge 110 feet in the process. Soon the Tidewater barge is ready to exit the lock and continue upriver. A westbound UP grain train appears above the barge as it rolls through the siding at Goff, 
on the Oregon side of the river. This illustrates the intense competition for freight service along the Columbia Gorge. The John Day Dam glows in the setting sun as a cold November breeze sweeps through the gorge. This time of year, shadows grow long on the Oregon side of the river, while Washington basks in the cool late afternoon sunshine. A BNSF Z train rolls through Hewitt and on to Mary Hill. As the train passes the Sam Hill Memorial Bridge, we cross back to the Washington side of the river. The original SPS grade offers great riverside views between Mary Hill and the John Day Dam. The tracks were moved to higher ground when the dam was built. A Seattle to Pasco manifest led by BNSF 8105 takes the new alignment near Malboard 116. Listen to the melodious throb of the two-stroke 16-cylinder 710 engines in a classic display of EMD power. As the train continues west, we head on to Mary Hill and take a look at a very interesting structure perched high above the river. Welcome to the Stonehenge World War I Memorial at Mary Hill, Washington. This is a full-sized astronomically aligned replica of the original Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England. Completed in 1929 by businessman Samuel Hill, it was the first monument in the United States to honor soldiers who died during the First World War. Its pillars rise 24 feet above the ground, forming a 108-foot circle. The original Stonehenge, built somewhere between 2000 and 3000 BC, is a broken-down remnant of its former self. Now part of the Mary Hill Museum of Art, Sam Hill's monument gives one a chance to see how the original may have looked in ancient times. The view from Stonehenge is spectacular, with a broad vista of the Columbia Gorge and Mount Hood. 
The original builders might have been proud to see this replica high above the BNSF mainline, and who knows, maybe some of them would have been rail fans too. Taking a closer look at Mount Hood, Oregon's tallest volcano, we spot an eastbound manifest train as it approaches a siding at Maryhill on a warm spring morning. We watch as the Pasco-bound train rolls past our location. Moving down to the west end of Maryhill, milepost 113, BNSF 9271 approaches with a westbound coal train. As the train disappears, it passes the Mary Hill Vineyard as it heads toward Wishram. The Sam Hill Memorial Bridge stands in the rain, connecting Oregon and Washington State. Looking across the river, we can see the town of Biggs, 
and their landmark grain elevators which serve area farmers who ship by barge. Other elevators give access to the UP and frame an eastbound manifest on its way to Hinkle, Oregon. On the Washington side, an eastbound Z train led by BNSF SD70 Mac number 9472 rolls out of a cut near milepost 111. The Fallbridge sub continues past Miller Island on its way to Wishram. Here we can see the original SPNS grade to the left as it joins the new alignment near milepost 110. The signals are lit all red, telling us an eastbound has just departed Wishram. BNSF 5506 leads an auto rack train below steep cliffs as it follows the Columbia upstream. From the southern flank of Haystack Butte, we get an aerial view of Wishram. Serving as a hub for trains coming out of Oregon and California, Wishram Yard is located just east of the Oregon Trunk Drawbridge, which stretches 4,197 feet across the river. A vertical lift is located near the south end of the bridge, allowing river barges to pass. The north end contains a Y to handle trains coming from Vancouver to the west or Pasco to the east. An Everett, Washington to Barstow, California train appears at the west leg of the Y and slowly makes its way onto the drawbridge. The span has not gone down, so the crew calls the Pasco West dispatcher on the radio. Coming up in 
coming down, you know, to the bridge, but uh, he's got a boat coming now. It'll be about 15, 20 minutes till that boat gets by, and he's going to try to lower it. Doesn't come down in like 20, 25 minutes, or after that boat goes by, give me a call back. Okay, uh, after the boat goes by, we'll hopefully it'll go down. Thank you, there, Terry. Maritime traffic has the right-of-way over trains, so the BNSF 4862 South will have to wait. With the tug out of the way and the draw in the down position, the train continues on to the Oregon Trunk subdivision. This route is known as the Inside Gateway, it is a corridor running along the east side of the Cascade Mountain Range between California and the Pacific Northwest. At the mouth of the Deschutes River, the 4862 turns south and enters the very scenic Deschutes River Canyon. In the next few days, this train will run through some very well-known railfan destinations, including the Feather River Canyon in Northern California and the famous Tehachapi Loop before arriving at Barstow. Dusk has settled in Wishram. The light of an eastbound intermodal train shimmers as it slowly approaches Wishram Center. It'll be stopping briefly for one westbound before continuing on to Pasco. A westbound grain train races by. Soon the BNSF 5465 gets a signal to continue east. The lights of Wishram glow on the north bank of the Columbia as a barge heads toward the Dalles. A different type of glow catches our eye as an eastbound stack train nears Tunnel 12, located at the east end of Wishram Yard. This is also the easternmost tunnel on the Fallbridge subdivision. We watch as the train disappears into the blackness of the bore. The next morning, a barge is seen passing under the Oregon Trunk drawbridge. 
We are located on a rock shelf above the Y track at the north end of the bridge. We know a train is coming off the trunk and will be here any minute. As we wait, we hear the sound of a westbound approaching. As the manifest exits stage right, the BNSF 5418 North comes into view. This train originated in Barstow and is bound for Vancouver. The crew has been instructed to tie the train down at Wishram, so it will be taking the east leg of the Y. Later on today, a fresh crew will Y the power here and take the train on to Vancouver. The line is double-tracked between Wishram and Avery. Near milepost 104, BNSF 5528 East approaches with a manifest. As it continues east, the train passes a gravel pit operated by Ross Island Gravel out of Portland, Oregon. The gravel is mined at this location and transported by barges to their facility near Portland. A 6,000-ton barge is being loaded with rock from a series of conveyor belts that run under the BNSF track. The gravel is used to make concrete. This operation is seasonal usually beginning in late March and running through the summer. The barges are loaded three days a week and are an interesting operation to watch, although you need special permission to be here during the loading process. Later on in the day, we caught up with the barge near Cook's, heading west to Portland with three big mounds of gravel weighing nearly 6,000 tons. A great view of Mount Hood opens up before us at West Avery. 
Below the mountain, another eastbound manifest can be seen heading our direction. The train is passing Horse Thief Lake, just east of the Dalles Dam. With a track speed of 60 for freight, it won't take long for the BNSF 5477 to reach our location. We get another vista of Mount Hood and the Dalles from a vantage point just west of the Dalles Dam. The name the Dalles came from the rapids that existed here before the dam was constructed in 1957. Today, the water is smooth and navigable as another tidewater barge works upriver. The tug tidewater is in charge of this tow. Two Fairbanks Morris 10-cylinder diesels provide 3,600 horsepower to the vessel and sound great as a barge passes by. Beneath the sound of the tug, another eastbound Z train approaches our location at milepost 95. A dead snag lies bleached on a bar as a chill of fall air fills the gorge, adding color to the landscape. We are back on the Oregon side opposite Lyle. BNSF 4197 East leads an empty grain train through the community of Lyle and Tunnel 11.
As the train continues east, we move back across the river and set up just west of Lyle, as BNSF 4795 East races past with a 91-car manifest. Crossing the tracks, we catch the 4774 pulling an eastbound auto rack train past Chamberlain Lake. From a windy vantage point, high above Tunnel 6, we watch an eastbound manifest exiting Tunnel 7. At the west bore of Tunnel 7, one can see clear through to Tunnel 6. Watch as a westbound garbage train rolls through both tunnels and right past the camera at 60 miles per hour. This gives you an idea of how quietly fast-moving trains can approach. The Columbia Gorge is a natural crossing of the Cascade Mountains. As we continue west, trees will slowly become more abundant on both sides of the river. 
We are now 82 miles from the west end of the Fallbridge subdivision as BNSF 5080 East leads a stack train between Lyle and Bingen. The train disappears into Tunnel 7, just out of view. A steady breeze continues to blow at the west end of a pier, separating the Columbia from Roland Lake. A westbound bear table led by BNSF 4110 appears out of a cut in the ever-present basalt rock. The rear unit, a GP39-2 number 2900, is just along for the ride. Next stop is Bingen. GP38 number 2136 leads a local out of Wishram into the 11,115 foot siding to meet a few eastbounds. The train is on its way to Home Valley to work a lumber mill. Bingen has a small mill of its own. The SDS Lumber Company has been in operation since 1946 and is one of the last remaining sawmills in the area. At a time where many mills have closed their doors, a parade of log trucks can still be found waiting to come into the yard at Bingen. Big machines are busy throughout the yard as logs are stacked and sorted. Even a water truck is employed to keep the dust down. There's nothing like the smell of a lumber mill. SDS Lumber specializes in lumber, plywood, power, and pulp for several markets. Most of the timber here comes from a 35-mile radius of the mill in Oregon and Washington. That's nearly 70,000 acres of timberland, all in the mid-Columbia Gorge. Besides lumber, SDS also has a tug and barge fleet, providing service to many customers along the river. A short distance from the yard, a loaded coal train is in the hole, and a high green shows for BNSF 7610 as it rolls through town.
While the SDNS Lumber Company is alive and well in Bingen, the same cannot be said for the old Broughton Mill at Hood, which closed back in 1986. This was a flume mill that processed rough sawn cants which were floated down the Broughton flume from another mill at Willard, nine miles and 1,000 feet up a mountain. The Broughton flume was the fastest and longest water flume in the world, operated between 1923 and 1986. The flume was featured in the television show Lassie, as well as a 1967 Disney movie, Charlie the Lonesome Cougar. Today, parts of the flume are still visible above Highway 14 west of Hood, and most of the mill structures are still in place. On the railroad, Hood is now a little-used 54-car siding and not considered a station in the current BNSF timetable. BNSF 712 East blasts through Hood with a vehicle train. Wildflowers decorate the banks of the river as we continue west, adding to the scenic beauty of the gorge. Milepost 69 puts us at the west bore of Tunnel 5, the Owl Rock Tunnel, in time to catch another Powder River Basin coal train. The train ducks under Highway 14 as it continues west. A westbound garbage train exits the granite bore of Drano Tunnel. At Cook's, we gaze across the river at the Oregon side. The rugged walls of the gorge that were barren a few miles to the east are now carpeted with green thick forests accented by waterfalls as the personality of the gorge continues to change. West of Cook's, trains curve around the base of Wind Mountain at a place called Windy Point before reaching Home Valley. The approaching train is the hottest on the BNSF a Z9 headed for Portland from Chicago.
Home Valley is milepost 59.3. BNSF 5471 East leads an Everett to Barstow Manifest over the Wind River Bridge and past the High Cascades Lumber Mill as evening approaches. Dusk settles in the gorge on a warm evening in mid-June. The sweet smell of early summer perfumes the air along the water's edge. The quiet setting is disturbed momentarily as a headlight appears through the trees. So much for the sweet smell of summer. We admit the loaded garbage train has a certain essence not found with other trains. But when it comes to taking out the trash, the BNSF does it well. BNSF 731 West crosses a bridge at Stevenson. Stevenson is just upriver from the Bridge of the Gods near Cascade Locks, Oregon. A sailboat works through the channel on a warm summer afternoon. The sternwheeler Columbia Gorge is a common sight during the summer months. This is an authentic triple-decker paddle wheeler built in Hood River, Oregon and launched in 1983. It is owned by the Port of Cascade Locks and operated by Portland Spirit who offer sightseeing excursions between May and October. This cruise is an excellent way to view the gorge, as well as a throwback to an earlier time. Travel by steamboat was common in the Columbia River back in the 1800s, but died off with the coming of the railroad. As we have seen, the Fallbridge subdivision offers some spectacular views of the gorge as well. For the railroaders who work here, this is just another day at the office. BNSF 4356 leads a westbound grain train out of the siding at Stevenson after making a meet with the stack train.
It's a rainy afternoon at the east bore of Tunnel 1.5, the North Bonneville Tunnel. Eastbound coal empties race through the 1,503-foot bore. The rear DP heads off into the rain as it passes milepost 50 and station sign North Bonneville, named for the nearby Bonneville Dam. We relocate to the west bore of Tunnel 1.5 as an eastbound empty garbage train approaches. Nearby tree branches sway from the draft caused by the fast-moving train in the tunnel. An eastbound Z train passes the Bonneville Dam at milepost 48.4. A light rain falls through the trees near Prindle as Amtrak 28 appears around a curve. Now that we are on the west side of the Cascades, rain is more common. The Pacific Northwest is known for its lush, thick forests and dense undergrowth, all fed with plenty of liquid sunshine. A prominent landmark in the area is a massive basalt formation named Cape Horn. A shaver grain barge appears from behind the giant rock as it passes Cape Horn Landing, once a steamboat stop on the river.
As the boat passes from view, the rain begins to pick up again. We are set up at the east end of Tunnel 1, known as the Cape Horn Tunnel. This is the longest of the 11 tunnels originally built by the SPNS. Soon we hear an eastbound Everett to Barstow as it exits the 2,382 foot bore. As the train passes the Cape Horn landing, we move to our next location, 770 feet straight up. The Cape Horn Overlook yields a fantastic view of the Columbia River Gorge and is a must for anyone visiting the area. We can even make out the tracks near Prindle where we last saw the eastbound Amtrak 28. This lofty vantage point is accessible from the shoulder of Highway 14. East of Washougal, trains roll through the trees past milepost 31 as they head for Cape Horn Tunnel. The Portland section of the Empire Builder is again seen approaching at 55 miles per hour. Trains continue through Washougal and Camas. We are now in southeast Vancouver, where the Fallbridge sub parallels southeast Evergreen Highway. BNSF 4025 West leads an intermodal train past milepost 17.3 and under the I-205 overpass. We have made it to Vancouver, Washington. A passenger station sits in the middle of the Vancouver Y and serves several Amtrak trains each day, including the Coast Starlight, Empire Builder, and several Cascades commuter trains. Just south of the station, a BNSF employee hangs new speed signs for the Columbia River Drawbridge, also known as Bridge 9.6. Looking through the 2,807-foot structure, we can see Amtrak 516 approaching on Main 1. This train runs daily between Eugene, Oregon and Seattle, Washington, and is due into Vancouver at 3.05 p.m. This is an Amtrak Cascades Talgo train set with an EMD F59 PHI on the point. The train stops along the northwest side of the station for people to board.
with everybody on board, Amtrak 516 continues north to Seattle. Bringing up the rear is an F40PH number 90253. The locomotive's engine has been removed and it is used as a cab car. It still retains its controls and is operated as the lead unit when the train runs south in push mode. A short time later, BNSF 4439 East departs Vancouver Yard on the third leg of the Y, heading for Pasco with a stack train. Vancouver marks the west end of the crew district on the Fallbridge subdivision. From the northwest side of the depot, we can see a section of the busy Vancouver Yard as the train departs. The Columbia River at Vancouver is busy as well. Cargo ships are moored for loading and unloading. Tidewater tugs and barges have customers to serve up and down the river. Bridge 9.6 is in the process of closing after a passing tug. This is a swing bridge, which pivots horizontally 90 degrees. We watch as the swing span closes to let more rail traffic pass. With the span back in the closed position, a BNSF local crosses the Columbia River on Main 2. UP 4294 South comes down through Vancouver Yard on Main 1 and waits its turn to cross the bridge. As usual, traffic is heavy at this major junction. A switch grinder is working up Main 1, while Amtrak 14, the northbound coast starlight, appears in the distance on Main 2. The grinder has permission to cross over in front of Amtrak and clears up past the depot. Next up, the Starlight pulls into the depot on Main 2. Yet another stop on its journey between Los Angeles and Seattle.
Soon the UP gets a signal to cross the bridge. As Amtrak 14 departs, we see another Amtrak approaching. This is the 28, the Portland section of the Empire Builder. It meets the UP on the bridge and will soon pull up along the northeast side of the station. Eastbound passengers eagerly await to board the train. The luggage is delivered, and soon the train is ready to go. Amtrak 28, here we go to Port Vancouver, delayed and blocking. One thing we can vouch for, these passengers are in for a grand trip through the Columbia Gorge. The Fallbridge subdivision terminates at Portland, Oregon, so we return to where we started at the beginning of part one of the series. The Vista Bridge gives us a nice view of Mount Hood overlooking the Rose City. Portland Max commuter trains roll through the streets in a place that is known for being train friendly. Union Station is milepost 0.0, .0 on BNSF's Fallbridge subdivision. The familiar clock tower looks on over another familiar site in Portland, the Southern Pacific Daylight 4449. In July of 2011, the 4449 made two consecutive round trips to Wishram and back, celebrating its 70th anniversary. And legendary engineer Doyle McCormick was at the throttle as the big GS4 Daylight steamed out of town. We reposition ourselves at the Columbia River Drawbridge in Vancouver as the steam special pulls into the depot. Doyle McCormick announces the train's arrival with the 4449's world-famous whistle.
East of Prindle, the classic daylight races toward Wishram. West of Stevenson, the 4449 pounds the rails on the 60 mile per hour track. On our return trip to Portland, the steam special sprints along the north bank of the Columbia River, just west of Lyle. As we take one last look at the 4449 just west of Wishram, we say goodbye for now and hope you've enjoyed this tour of the BNSF in the spectacular Columbia River Gorge. Thanks for watching.